um, and uh, it's a pretty good challenge. Nobody else in the competition or any any other uh, model rockets, uh, high powered rocket stuff, to my knowledge, has ever tried it. Mm. Which I mean, there may be a good reason for that, but um, we don't know that yet. I see. I see. So it's just essentially would expose the payload in a different way. Having a nose cone or a payload in the nose cone is not like a nose cone. I see. I see. So, what are you trying to do? But deploy the payload. So we want to deploy the payload from the nose cone. Oh. But have the nose cone have fairings that attract with it. Okay. And is, uh, it, is it like those, um, uh, not, not the Galaxy, not the, uh, is it the Galaxy? No. Some of the airplanes where they have like the uh oh the, the nose cone that flips up. Yeah. yeah, so it'll be kind of like that, but imagine that the nose comes back and split in half. Mm -hmm. and half of it comes up, the other half will pull down. So for our case, <laughs> nose cone fairings would kind of block those. So, like space, I mean you ever watch the SpaceX launches and stuff? Yeah. They always put a camera or something like that on yeah. the inside of the payload, and then they watch the nose cone fairings kind of and they fall away from the stuff. We're doing that, only we're not allowed to let the bearings fall away. We okay. have to remain with the vehicle. So. Otherwise, someone's going to get mad. Yeah, we can't have like parts of a rocket plummeting to the ground. <laughs> the well, that's why you make it a flammable. Yeah. So by the time it hits the ground, it's nothing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, we're only going 10,000 feet. We're not able to get to, uh, you know, a few thousand feet to, in order to, or a few, you know, a few thousand feet above. On Carmen in order to uh, burn our stuff up in the end. Well, then just uh, have a little extra, like, uh, you know, the fireworks. Oh, yeah. 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 This is the new age of play, Fourth of July. Uh, yeah. um, so. Well, then the uh, so we'll do the payload like eject from it. Yeah, that's the idea. Okay. However, it would implement we could um, use like a spring loaded system or, or or even a pneumatic system or whatever process it's up to them. Maybe like a little you know uh, CO2 cartridges. Um, yeah, yeah. that'd be for like the uh, like the CO2 aerosol and whatnot. Maybe you can have a like uh, you just have something that like poke a hole. So we are planning on the recovery is planning on using CO2 as the main um, mechanism for deployment for our parachutes. And so um, ideally um, our payload could incorporate the same kind of idea in order to and one way you can have it where maybe like you know when you say you're gonna have like the house phones open, have it where like it also um, uh, punctures the hole with the CO2. Like kind of all in one oh yeah, 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 yeah. But then the uh, but the danger of that is that it could bring into the uh, puncture and destroy the and no, it's going to well. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of things that have to work all together. But it sounds fun though. Yeah, it's going to be exciting. We don't know if it's. It depends on kind of really what payload decides to do because if they they could make a system that doesn't need to be deployed and if they do that then there's no reason to go through the extra steps of those uh, uh, extra complicated those things. So, yeah. a lot of it's very subhuman kind of so. right uh, Oh, we had, uh, I don't know if you were here earlier in the shop, but we had those uh, electric people come by. Wait, you came here? Yeah, it's like the uh, company that uh, deals with anything, everything related to uh, electric or electricity storage. And, uh, oh, 
Some stuff and they end up setting fire like to the shop. <laughs> so well, it wasn't anything like you know burning down the buildings or anything like too serious. No one really hurt. But the there were like you know three fire departments came up and it was a big deal. That sounds like uh, uh, we need to expand our uh, buildings. I think there's some. Uh, I think there's some empty lots uh, around us. But yeah, no, that would be interesting though. And that would be kind of even more interesting to see if you can like uh sort of like the uh programmers too. Yeah, I'd I'd love to have a lot more cross collaboration and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, but it's just on the map. On the map, yeah. Can I ask you something? Sure. So, about the, um, the activity, mm -hmm. the second one. Um, so, you just, there was like a part of like saying like the weight like the, of a person is like 140. <laughs> Yep. But I was just thinking, like, the only situation that, that would, like, you know, be applicable in just, you know, uh, designing the bike would mm -hmm. be, like, when the person is actually standing on the pedal. Yep. Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the only situation. Yep. And that's, like, a tension force, not, like, a compression force. So it has nothing to do with the compression that we just calculated in the previous one. It would be, I mean, there, there's, there's lots of different scenarios. I mean, the, uh, the person would be pushing down on it. It depends on which, on where, on what position the pedal is in. I mean, so the, the full compression, would be like, uh, the full sorry. compression would be like when the when the pedal is kind of like this upwards. The, you right? mean the bike crank? The crank, yes. The crank is upwards, yeah. and the person is pushing down like, like exactly. This. Yeah. So exactly, so it's just pushing downward on the um, on the pedal, which is like the uh, the force that we're actually applying. Yep. Mm -hmm. Right. If we just assume that there's no pedal and like the force is like um, right. directly mm -hmm. applied to the bike. Right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Um. So we just we can assume like the the compression force that we calculated with that yield strength and everything mm -hmm. is just the same amount can be assumed for torsion torsional as well or uh, I, I wouldn't say know. I wouldn't go that far because every because every directions is going to be a little bit different and so you saw that like when you when you do bending 
right? When you when you put the force in the y direction, you get like a maximum load. It's like 125, 126, right? But in compression, you can load it a lot more, just because you know that's that's a different direction for loading. Exactly. And so if you do torsion, you know you're going to get a different value. But not not torsion, tensional. I mean compression and then tension. You just ah. you're just standing. Mm -hmm. You just actually just um, like the opposite side in the x direction instead yes. of mm -hmm. negative x, right? Yeah. Um, Probably because it's uh because the material we picked was isotropic, and so it's uh um you know it's I'm, I'm guessing it behaves the same intention as in compression. As in so compression. should you probably be able to load it in this with the same value of the force? Um, you can try it though. I mean, whatever force that you find for compression, you can just make it a positive value, and then you should, and then you can see if you get the same exact same stresses. I think you should because it's not it's an isotropic material. What do you mean by isotropic material? It's no matter which way that you load it, it's going to be you're going to experience the same stresses because the metal the metal is basically pretty homogeneous. Right. And so no matter which way you cut the metal, you know it's it's going to behave the same just because of how densely packed it is. But it's different from like a wood because like a wood has like the fibers that run through it. And so if you load the wood in the fiber direction, it's going to be stronger than if you load it kind of perpendicular to it. So that's what's called a um. Um, an anisotropic material. Yeah. It's like cutting a steak as well. Like exactly. Yes. The fiber exactly. With it. Yeah. Right. 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 So the fibers make a difference on how it, it behaves as a material. I see. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, it's a uh, five thirty, so let's go ahead and get started today. All right, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Or I guess it's evening time. Um, how's everyone doing today? Good, good, good to hear. Good weekend, everybody. Hopefully. All right. Um, so the uh, um, so the plan for today is, um, you know, we're at, we're now we're gonna, you know, I think this is kind of the point of the class where you know it kind of starts to take off in a different direction because. You know, up to this point, you know, I've had you guys do two, you know, full activities in ANSYS. And I've kind of just been telling you what to do in terms of like the meshing and the boundary conditions. A little bit less on the last activity, but, you know, more or less, you know, kind of the same thing. But um, so starting today, you know, we're actually going to start talking about, you know, how do we actually make these decisions on things like meshing, things like the boundary conditions and things like material properties. Okay. And so we're going to start getting into the details of like how you actually run you know, a finite element simulation and a lot of the uh, a lot of the information and, and kind of theory behind that. Okay. And so today we're starting with meshing. And so meshing is is a really rich topic and it's and this is not the last time we're going to see it. And so meshing is, is something we're going to revisit, you know, quite often in this class. Uh, but I thought today, you know, just to kind of get you started, um, you know, we're going to we're going to just cover what I call like the very basics of meshing. And so I think these are kind of very basic kind of meshing concepts that everyone should kind of understand you know, as they go about finite elements. And, you know, and the reason I kind of have this at this point in the semester, you know, after we've done two ANSYS activities, is that what I hope is that, you know, after you kind of have experienced what meshing is and in terms of, you know, the practical, the practical application, now that we're going to get some, some information behind it, you're just going to give some context for a lot of the decisions that you're, that you've been making. 
All right, question in the chat. So no answers this week. Correct. So the uh, so our next answers activity is going to be next Thursday. And so our schedule for answers is, you know, we do an activity every other week. And so since we just did one last Thursday, this week we're going to do just regular lectures and then next week we'll do answers. Okay. Um, okay. Um, um, all right. And so, you know, I, it is it is quite a bit to cover. So I, I do want to get into it. But before we before we get started, are there any questions I can answer on the activity or just anything general for the class? Okay, all right, so let's go ahead and get into it. All right, and so this, uh, the title for this notes is gonna be Meshing Basics. Yeah, it's a uh, skewness. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get to it. Yeah, it's exactly as, as Chris um, spelled it. Okay, and so, you know, uh, meshing is something that we've, we've, you guys have been doing up to this point, okay? but just to kind of give a formal definition for it, meshing is basically the act of taking any kind of complicated geometry Taking any uh, complicated ge complicated geometry and break it and break it up into a bunch of smaller, simpler shapes. Okay, and so I, I use the word complicated here a little bit liberally, because I think you know when people think of something complicated, they think of something that's very um, you know um, robust. But you know in this context, complicated just means something that's that has more um, has more features than just a straight up cube. Okay, and so basically any almost any geometry that you can think of is going to be can be classified as a complicated geometry, right? So if you think of like this table. You think of like that that pack of uh, of uh, of Clorox wipes over there. All of those I would consider as complicated geometries, just because they're not, you know, just a simple cube. Okay. And you know the reason we do this, and the reason you know the reason we need to do this for finite elements is that remember the goal for finite elements is that we want to solve you know these complicated um, partial differential equations on our geometry, right? And you know really it's it's kind of impossible to do that when your geometry has any kind of um, complexity. So think back to your, your previous classes, you know, maybe your math classes or 308, you know, where you solve um, differential equations, right? Maybe you didn't realize it at the time, but you know, the only, the only, at least, at least when I taught 308, the only um, you know, geometry that I asked that I asked, you know, my students to solve differential equations on was a simple line, right? Um, and you can't really get any simpler than a line. And so once you get, you know, something more complicated than a line, it starts to get, you know, um, way too complicated to do. Um, but the way finite elements works is that if you break up your geometry into these smaller, simpler, predetermined shapes, um, then finite elements has a way to solve the differential equations on those. Okay, and so the key to this is that the shapes that you um, that you break things into, um, those are predetermined beforehand. Okay. Or in other words, you know, the, uh, the software or the, uh, um, or the measure knows exactly what shapes it wants to use kind of before you, you go to do it. Okay. Um, and so you got you guys got a taste of this in the last, um, in the last instance activity, you know, I, when I ask you guys to produce like a hex dominant mesh or like a tetrahedral mesh, right? And so what you're doing um, there is that you're kind of deciding beforehand, 
you know, I'm going to use this specific shape to fill my, my volume, right? Whether they be hexahedrons or tetrahedrons, uh, for two, or for 2D case, they be triangles or quadrilaterals, okay? Um, and there's only so many shapes that are available in finite elements just because, you know, most of the shapes that are out there just aren't practical. And so the, the shapes that you'll see are, are really kind of the simplest ones that you can kind of think of. And we'll go over kind of the, the effect of shape, you know, later on in the lecture today, okay? All right. And so the, the next important point is that, you know, there's, there's no best way to mesh an object. And so do you, there's no way to really determine and say, you know, if you have this object here, you know, this is the best mesh possible. Because there's, there's literally infinite ways that you can mesh of an object. And there's actually a lot of random randomness associated with it too, right? And so actually, you know, if you if you take the exact same geometry, you know, and then um, you apply the exact same meshing set, and so you apply this exact same size, the shapes, and everything um, as somebody else, right? And so let's say you and your friend kind of took the same bike crank and mesh it with the same size and shape, you know, I think there's there's a 99% probability, even higher than that, 99.99% probability that both your meshes are going to be different, okay? And so what I mean by that is the number of elements are probably going to be different. The exact location for all the elements is, is going to be different. Okay? And so there's always going to be a, a, a slight degree of randomness in generating the mesh. Okay. Um, it might not look that way. And so like, you know, when you're kind of looking at it visually, it might, it, it might look, you know, your mesh might look the same as somebody else, but you know, in all the details of where all the elements are, there's some randomness associated with that. And so because of that, you know, there's literally infinite, infinite ways to, to do it. Okay. Um, and as such, you know, it's it's impossible to really determine what a best mesh would look like. Okay. okay. And so there's no there's no perfect mesh. There's no you know. Just like there's no perfect human being, right? And so it's it's all subjective, okay? But 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 even then, you know, even though there's no best mesh, we can say that we can definitely say that there are some meshes that are better than other ones, okay? Right. And so the goal of, of my goal for the lecture today is, is to kind of give you guys the kind of the, the, the elementary kind of basic tools for which you can say that, you know, this mesh is better than, than that mesh. And here are the metrics and here are the, um, you know, here's the information to kind of back, back that up. Okay. All right. Yep. Are there element shapes that are better? Uh, that are we'll, we'll, talk, we'll talk about that too. Yeah. Um, short answer, yes. There, there are some that are better than others. Mm -hmm. All right, and so you know, kind of like what I mentioned before, you know, meshing is is a really, really rich topic, um, and and you know, for um, and honestly, you know, for for most practical situations, this is what you're going to be banging your head against the wall for most of the time because it's you know, it's real. Sometimes it's really, really hard to get a decent mesh for for an object, you know, especially if your geometry is really challenging. And so, you know, this is this is a topic we're going to revisit quite a bit, but you know, um, just know that you know, meshing is is you know. Meshing is kind of the, the it's, it's the most time that most of, for most people, this is the time you'll spend most at your computer kind of tinkering around with stuff, trying to get things to work out. It's, it's, it's to try to get a mesh that, that works. Okay. Uh, all right. So any questions on, on this before we move on? Okay. All right. So let's start talking about, you know, what makes a good mesh? And so I have two kind of, you know, main metrics that I use to kind of determine what a good mesh is, right? And so to kind of put it simply, you know, the mesh, the mesh, you know, it's, it's a really important part of your finite elements, but it's not the star, right? And so no one's going to marvel at your mesh, you know, and say, you know, what a good finite element engineer you are, right? Um, and so what they're going to be looking at is they're going to be looking at your computational results, um, and they're going to be looking at how quickly you can get them to them, right? Um, and so... To me, you know, a good finite element mesh is one that will produce an accurate finite element simulation. Okay. 
And so accuracy is, is one important consideration. And the other consideration is cost, okay? And so you want to maximize accuracy, but you want to minimize computational costs. And so those are the two factors that you know we're we're going to go over. Okay? okay. All right. So let's start with accuracy. All right. So accuracy refers to how well your finite element simulation will predict reality. Okay. Okay. Because ultimately, you know, um, you're going to be running finite element simulations on, you know, on, on physical situations that you want that you're going to see in real life, right? And so the most useful finite element simulations are going to be the ones that actually predict reality really closely, right? And so if you if you take, you know, the results, you know, you take how you set up your finite element simulation and you set up the exact situation in real life with the exact same boundary conditions. An accurate finite element simulation will produce basically the exact same thing. So the exact same deformation and the exact same stresses, okay? And so you want, you want this as, as accurate as possible because if your finite element simulation predicts something else, you know, then that's gonna produce, you know, a lot of, a lot of issues, okay? All right. All right, so generally, you know, so generally what you expect is that as, as you refine the mesh or as you make the element smaller, then the accuracy for your simulation will go up, okay? Okay. And the reason for this is that, you know, across, basically across every single element in your mesh, you know, the, the finite element software is making an approximation for what it thinks the solution is going to be. And so the smaller your elements are, the less approximating it has to do. Okay. All right, and so on the next page, I'm, I'm going to give you kind of a simple kind of 1D illustration for this, um, just to kind of give you just to kind of give you an idea of what this you know approximation means and you know how refining your elements actually increases your accuracy. Okay. Uh, so before I do that, are there uh, any questions on on this? Okay. All right, so let's do let's do just a simple illustration just to kind of show you you know what I mean by by all this. Okay. So this is a 1D case, and so we're not going to do any 1D FDM in this class, but I think it's a, you know, it's a good, it's kind of a good illustrative um, case here, okay? Okay, and so, you know, in both these cases, let's say that we have the solution to a, a differential equation, okay? And it looks something like this, okay? 
And so in black right here, what I'm showing is, is like the true solution to this differential equation. Okay. And on the left right here, I'm going to show you what it looks like if you use just one element to approximate this. And on the right right here, I'll show you what it looks like when you have three elements. Okay. All right. And so, you know, for the one element case, you know, this single element is going to span the entire domain, right? And so the approximation that, that, um, um, that results is something that looks like this, okay? And so let's say that, you know, we're using linear finite elements. And so the element order is linear. And so in between our two endpoints there, we're going to use a linear function, okay? And so we basically have all this area here, right? In between the, in between the true solution and the approximation where we're, you know, where we're not getting, you know, the right answer, okay? And so that's, that kind of represents the error. Okay. Meanwhile, for the three element one, you know, this is going to do a much better job of approximating because, you know, even if we use linear functions like this, right, the fact that we have less approximating to do, the fact that, you know, our, our nodes can, can hug the, the true solution better means that our error is going to be much less, okay? okay? And so by making our elements smaller and, and thus increasing the number of elements that we have, we end up with a much more accurate um, approximation than, than before, okay? And so there's there's always you know no matter what kind of finite elements you do there's there's always going to be this correlation between you know how big your elements are and, and how accurate solution is going to be okay um, but element size is not the only factor okay and so besides element size there's also things like the element shape uh, the skewness and the topology of the geometry all of these things contribute to accuracy but out of all those things you know size is most of the time going to be the most dominant factor. Okay? And in fact, you know, for a lot of for a lot of cases, you know, for a lot of the other factors that of the mesh that affect accuracy, if you if you simply make your elements smaller, it actually solves a lot of those issues too. Right? Um, all right. And so, you know, since we know that the uh, you know the element size, if you if you make them smaller, you're going to end up with a better quality solution. And so, the the fair question to ask, and and actually, you know, quite a few people have, have already asked me this throughout the activities. You know, why don't you just make the elements really, really, really small, right? You know, why don't we just, you know, just basically kill the thing with elements and make them all microscopic size, okay? Um, and so in a, in a perfect world and, you know, with infinite resources and infinite time, you can. And so there's, there's nothing really stopping you there, you know, where you can just make the elements as, as small as you can. Um, and you can get kind of the best finite element solution ever. Uh, unfortunately, you know, we live in the real world with real constraints. And so the thing that's stopping you um, from, from doing this, from making your elements really small is the computational cost. Okay. And so the analogy that I like to draw for this is like you, you guys probably have seen the meme where like, you know, there's the guy and there's a girl that's walking by him and he like wants to hit on her, but then someone stops him. And so that thing that stops him is this computational cost. And it's, all, and it's, and it's always there, you know, it's, uh, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's no stopping computational cost. So that's the, 
you know, that's the thing that, that ruins your day. Uh, okay, uh, any questions on this before we start talking about cost? Yeah. Yeah, no, it's a good question. I, I wish there was. It's, uh, it's, it's really kind of impossible to determine kind of beforehand because there's a lot of factors that go into, you know, how long a simulation will take. Um, not, it's not only the amount of elements that you have, but it's also just the boundary conditions and how it all kind of interacts with each other. Um, eventually, you know, once, once you kind of run enough, you start to get kind of an intuition of like, you know, I have this many elements and this kind of situation. And so I think it's going to run me, you know, approximately like maybe half an hour, an hour. Um, but that, but that usually comes with, with time and intuition. So yeah, a lot of times it's, it's, it's difficult. Yeah. Uh, how would you know if it's, uh, it's working versus a practice zero? Usually if it's, um, you can you a lot of the best way usually is to look at your task manager and to see if it's overloading your memory and if it's doing that um, and the program's not responding then it's it's probably going to crash your computer yeah. but for 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 everything we're going to do in this class you you don't have to worry about it all too much just because you know uh, luckily we're uh, we're we're limited by something you know even beyond just your computer's limits which is um, the power of money and so the uh, ansys is a company right and so they have to sell their software and so the way that they do that is they give out these these nice free student versions, but you can only do really small problems. On it. And so if you want if you want to do anything that's even you know moderately costly, you have to buy the full version, which is uh, very expensive. And so you know luckily for this class, there's you don't have to worry about that. And so anytime you have to anytime you're going to do anything relatively expensive, Ansys will stop you. It'll do the 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 mean thing, and then it's uh um and so it's something you don't have to worry about. Yeah, question. All right. Um, so just for clarification, the elements are smaller. Um, they would generate a more accurate result. Yes, yes. Um, and so most in most cases, if your elements are, are smaller, it's going to generate a more accurate result. Okay. So remember the uh, the analogy I gave you on on kind of early on in the class, which the um, when you think when you think about your element size and and the accuracy of your results, think of like a like a di digital image resolution. Yes, exactly. Yeah. If you have smaller elements, you're going to generally have more elements within the surface area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for you know for digital image resolution, the more pixels you have, the better your, your image is gonna look. Okay, any more questions? Okay, so let's start talking about computational cost. All right, so we, we've kind of alluded to it at this point, you know, just based on the questions that you know I, I've just answered, but just to kind of formalize it. You know, when I, when I say computational cost, what I mean is the amount of time and the amount of computer memory that's needed to run your simulation. And so um, as you make your elements smaller, or, or I guess more specifically, as the number of your elements, as the number of elements in your mesh goes up, the computational cost is also going to go up. And the reason for that is, you know, as the number of elements in your mesh goes up, you know, your computer has to do more and more arithmetic calculations, right? Um, and so even though a, com a computer is really good at doing arithmetic, it'll do arithmetic, you know, way faster than a human does. But, you know, as the number of elements goes up, that, that number of calculations might go from, you know, a few hundred thousand to a few million to a billion, you know, and it, it ramps up really, really quickly. And so even for a computer, doing a billion calculations will take it, you know, a decent, decent amount of time, okay? All right, and so you know, just like I mentioned, you know, we don't have to worry about that in this class, but it's, uh, but it's it's a big concern when when you get out there, you know, and you start using finite elements for more um, more complicated problems. And so, just to kind of, just to kind of give you a sense, and so for a lot of the simulations that I did, you know, as part of my 
um, as part of my, my graduate research, most of those would take on the order of hours. And so anywhere between you know, eight and 12, 16 hours to, to run. Okay. Um, and those are on, and that's on a supercomputing cluster too. So that's not on a desktop computer. That's on, you know, a big server rack full of, you know, dozens of processors. But I've also seen simulations that will hog up an entire cluster of, of, of computers for, for weeks. And so I know some simulations that would hog up, you know, there's a big supercomputer down at um, University of Texas, Austin, and they have literally like, you know, hundreds of thousands of processors. I've seen a simulate, I've seen a single simulation take up, you know, a couple hundred thousand processors and it took them three weeks to run the whole thing. And so it, it ramps up like crazy. And so the simulations you guys are running on, on, on these computers, you know, they finish within, you know, a, a few seconds or a minute, you know, those are, you know, not the, there, there's, there's a huge range, there's a huge range to these, these things. So, you know, it might not seem like that big a deal. Cause I, I remember when I first learned this, you know, I thought, you know, I'm, I'm a patient guy. I can wait a couple minutes for a simulation result, but, but it's, uh, you know, it, it starts to get pretty crazy. And so it's, it's, it's not anything that we're going to be overly concerned about with this class, but it's, it, it does ramp up quite a bit. Okay. And so as you can see, you know, we have these two factors of accuracy and computational costs and they, and they oppose each other. Right. And so you, as you make one better, the other one gets worse. Okay. And so, you know, it's really hard to get a mesh that makes both of them, you know, uh, maximize, right? Because as you try to maximize one, the other one will, will kind of naturally get worse. And so your goal, your, your goal when finding a mesh and, and determining the size for your mesh is to kind of find that sweet spot where, you know, the accuracy is good enough for what you need to do. And the cost is low enough that you're, you know, that you're happy with it. Okay. All right. And so the, the, the word that I want to highlight here is enough, right? And so, you know, when I say, you know, you're actually, your accuracy has to be enough, you know, that's, that's a little bit of a vague phrasing because what, what, what does enough accuracy mean? Um, and unfortunately, you know, it's, it's one of those things where I kind of have to hand wave this and say that it depends on your application um, because there'll be some applications where you really need really tight accuracy like you need to estimate the stresses up to like the third decimal place and that needs to be on point. Uh, but there are other finite element applications where you, you kind of just, all you really need is just, you know, a, a ballpark of, you know, where the maximum stresses are. Um, and so in those cases, you know, you, you can be, you can be a bit, a little bit more liberal in, in, in how you, you know, define accuracy. Right? Um, and I wasn't going to talk, I wasn't really going to talk about this until, you know, much later in the semester. I think it's kind of a good time to, um, to kind of introduce it because I think it kind of encapsulates um, all of this really nicely. Okay. And so a um, kind of a, a test that, you, that you're gonna have to do for a lot of your finite element simulations is something known as a mesh convergence test. Yep. Going back to the uh, getting your simulation to like the decimal place, is that kind of like a factor of safety or something like that? Yeah, and so that's part of it too. And so, it's, and so for some, uh, for some, uh, for some applications, like you know, getting that that stress to like a certain decimal place, it is it is a, a, a um, um, it is a safety consideration because like you know, if you're if you're designing like an airplane and you're using a finite elements to design the whole. Like you have to be really tight on that because the factors factors of safety on those are razor thin. Um, but you know, but if you're designing something, you know, like like a like a children's toy or something like that, then it's then you have a lot more 
a lot more leeway in how, how accurate it can be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, so a mesh convergence test is uh, basically, uh, you know, it's basically a way to assess, you know, how accurate your mesh is for a certain quantity, okay? And so the way this works is that you're gonna, you're gonna run the exact same simulation on multiple different meshes. Okay. And so what I mean by same simulation is that you use the same material properties and the same boundary conditions. And so the only thing you're changing in between different runs is, is the density of your mesh or the size of the mesh, okay? Okay. Right. And then for each simulation, you're gonna you're gonna track or you're gonna you're gonna um, write down uh, what the what the value is for a certain you know key quantity of interest. Okay. And so the idea with the mesh convergence test is that, you know, as you start to refine your mesh, um, and so usually, you know, usually the way these things go is you, you start with a very coarse mesh and you start with, you know, fairly, uh, very mar fairly large elements. And then you start to refine your mesh more and more and more, okay? And so eventually what you see is that as you refine your mesh, you know, this quantity of interest is gonna change in value, but eventually you're gonna reach a point where if you refine the mesh further, then that quantity of interest is not gonna change anymore, okay? And so, and, and the way that we call that is we say that that quantity has converged, okay? And so I'll show you what, what, a, what a sample plot of those looks like on, on the next page. And, and basically the idea is that you wanna reach that point where you start to get that plateau in this graph, okay? And so what that tells you is that, you know, accuracy has kind of reached a point, uh, the accuracy of your mesh has reached a point where, you know, if you refine the mesh anymore, you don't really get any benefit out of it, right? And that's a great place to be, because then that, that basically tells you that at this point right here, this is where, you know, we get the most accuracy for the least amount of cost that we, that we have. Um, okay, so any uh, any questions on on this? Yeah, with that convergence test, uh, I think you know you didn't like um, things that, like went smaller. So how do you know you didn't run into the problem uh, with computational cost? You'll um, we'll, we'll we'll talk about that in a bit. It's I, I think it's someone someone yesterday asked kind of a very similar question where. You know, to kind of produce this plot, you kind of need to kind of go past. You just necessarily have to go past that point where cost is is minimized. Um, and so, it's this is not something that you use to to find the perfect mesh. It's more something that you use to 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 prove that you know the mesh that I used was was good. It's more of a verification thing. And so that's that's why you know I, I'm saving the detailed discussion for this kind of later on in the semester. Kind of that's that's kind of when we're that's what that's kind of when we get to the point where like you know. You've run the simulation, and so how do you convince people that simulation is actually legit? And so mesh convergence test is actually one thing that you do. And so it's not really a tool that you use to, you know, what's the best mesh that I can use before I run it. It's more something you run after and so. But it's I think I think just the visual of you know what the graph looks like I think is kind of a good encapsulation of this accuracy versus cost kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So when we're starting off. Um... Well, time is going to be always a factor. So, are we just eyeballing what mesh we think will, will be the best to start off with? Yeah, okay. yeah. And so, um, you know, when you're first, you know, when you're first um, getting to a, uh, when you're first running a simulation, um, and as you kind of run a bit more, you start to get some intuition for like, you know, these mesh, this, these elements look pretty good to me. 
And then that's kind of a good place to, to start. And so, you know, you guys have already kind of, are starting to kind of build that already. And so in the past couple of activities, you know, I'm having you kind of tinker around with the different mesh settings. And so, you know, my, my goal with that is, you know, is to kind of give you a visual of, you know, this is what a good mesh looks like. And so if you can kind of recreate that, I don't want to say look, but, you know, but as, as you kind of see a lot of meshes and you see what really works, then you kind of get a sense for, you know, this, this mesh is something good to start with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And so when you run a mesh conversion test, this is kind of what it looks like. And so you, you, it looks like kind of a, a, a scatter plot graph. And so on the X axis, we have, um, you know, there's, there's lots of different ways you can describe it, but the way, the, the classical way that I see it is um, the, the X axis um, is the number of elements in your mesh. Okay. Or in other words, that the, another way that you can um, describe it as this is, this is tracking the cost, okay? Because the more elements that you have in the mesh, the more cost your simulation is gonna be. And then on the y-axis here, you're going to have your quantity of interest. Okay. And so what this graph is showing you is like, you know, um, how the quantity of interest is changing as you increase the number of elements in your, in your mesh. Okay. And so a lot of times your quantity of interest will be something like, like a maximum stress. I think that's, that's a very, you know, classical kind of, you know, reasonable thing to pick. Uh, but sometimes it could be something as, as like the deformation. It could be like a shear stress or a normal stress. And so really it's, it's the way you define quantity of interest is usually what you're most interested in getting out of your finite element simulation. What's the one number, what's the one piece of data that you want, right? And if you have multiple things that you want, you know, just pick the most important one. And then that's, that's, that's what you can use. Okay? And so generally these mesh convergence plots look something like this. Okay? And so when you start out, you, know, you, run some, you run a very cheap simulation, you, your quantity of interest might look like that. But then as you refine, your quantity of interest will start to change in value, okay? And then we can connect these dots to be something like that, okay? Right. And so this is, this is basically showing you that, you know, as you refine the number of elements, you know, the, your quantity of interest is getting closer and closer to its true, its true physical value, okay? But eventually you kind of reach a point and, you know, let's, let's say that it's here, just kind of arbitrarily, right? And so, like, you know, once we kind of reach this point and we go further to the right, um, you know, uh, as we go further to the right, you know, the number of elements and the cost is increasing, but you can see we're not really getting any benefit from it, right? And so the quantity of interest, it's, it's changing a little bit. And so I, I try to make it so that it doesn't completely plateau out, but the, but the curve is basically flat, okay? And so this is the this is the place where you want to be. And so this is kind of where the sweet spot is, where you kind of maximize, you get the most out of accuracy as you can, you know, for the least amount of cost. And so going back to your question earlier, you know, in order to produce this plot, you kind of necessarily have to get, you have to run simulations that are more expensive than what you would have to. And so this is not this is not really a tool that you would use to say, to say that you know um, this is the best mesh possible because if because if you ran a simulation over here right you might as well just use that for your simulation results because you already went through the trouble of, of running that simulation and so um, this is kind of more of a way just to say that you know after you've done everything and you say that you know I'm going to report all my results to my manager using this mesh right here okay this is a way to kind of show your manager that you know. I did, I kind of did my due diligence and, you know, this mesh is, is as accurate as it could be. Yeah. Yeah. So in the example, if we got like, once the uh, uh, preliminary survey was good spot, I mean, if you were to do just one extra test and it just shows a trend of climate change versus the previous test where, you know, you have the sweet spot thing. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's, that's one way that you can do it practically is that if you, you know, if you're, if you're kind of trying to find out the best mesh and you're refining your mesh, and you see that you refine your mesh um, a little bit, but the, the quantity only changes maybe like, you know, less than 1%, then you're probably, it's a good chance that you're, you're in that sweet spot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. Okay. And so now let's start to talk about um, element shapes. Okay. 
Okay. And so, you know, kind of like what I mentioned uh, um, at the beginning is that, you know, the shapes that you use for your finite element simulation are predetermined. Okay. And so there's only so many options that, that you can have. And so actually, you know, um, you know, for uh, for this class, I'm, I'm going to say that you only have two options for either 2D and two options for 3D. Okay. Okay. And so let's uh, let me list out the uh, the shapes for you, and I'll do it in a table. And so on one row, I'll show you the 2D element shapes. The next row, I'll show you the 3D ones. Okay. And so there's there's basically I, there's you know and the reason I'm doing this is is I want to group you know two um, you know two of these together okay and so on the one hand I have uh, uh, what you have what what are called you know the triangular element types okay. right and so those those two kind of behave the same way both in two D and three D and so that's why I kind of group them together and then the other category are the rectangular ones. All right, and so the 2D triangular element is a simple triangle. Right? And then in 3D, the triangular element is the tetrahedron. And so the tetrahedron is a four-sided pyramid. And so for the rectangular elements, the uh, the 2D version is a quadrilateral. And the 3D one is a hexahedron. And so your hexahedron is a uh, is basically a it's basically a dice. And so it's a six-sided polygon. Right? So hence the name hex. Okay. And so another name that you'll see for hexahedrons, if you if you read any finite element forums or you look online, is often people will call these your um, brick elements okay. because they look like a brick. And also, I think hexahedron is too hard to say for a, for what's basically just a box. And so, I think a lot of people prefer to, to call them bricks just because it's it's easier to say. Okay. All right. And so. Um, you know, no matter if you're in 2D or 3D, you know, I would say the triangular elements behave kind of the same way and the rectangular ones kind of behave the same way too. And so on the next page, I'll talk about, you know, what are the properties of, of these two element shapes, when you would want to use one over the other one, and what's kind of generally most preferred. And so because of, and so, you know, generally there's, there's a shape that you want to use, you know, when you can, but the, the, the unfortunate thing is you can't use it all the time just because it's, it's a little bit, you know, um, okay, so any uh, any questions on on this? Okay. All right, so let's talk about triangular um, triangular elements first, and let's see what they're what they're good at. Okay. All right, so triangular elements have this really unique and really useful properties that you can. In that you can use them to mesh any geometry. And so what that means is that if you choose to make a, a 2D triangle mesh or, or a 3D tetrahedron mesh, you know, you're never going to get a mesh failed error. And so it's always going to succeed. Okay. 
And so this property that, you know, you can use it to mesh any geometry, this is what's called the simplex property. And the reason it, the reason it can do this is that a triangle and a tetrahedron, you know, they're they're kind of naturally kind of lopsided. Okay, that's not the technical term for it. But that, that's kind of what I like to think of them as. Right. Right. And so what I mean by that is, you know, let's you know we'll just kind of draw a triangle right here. Okay. And you kind of look at it just kind of you know straight on like like this, right? If you consider this top end. This top end is skinnier, right? Because it, just because it's the pointy, is you know the top pointy end of the triangle. Okay. And on the bottom here, you know this is more more wide, okay. right? And so you kind of you know just within that same shape, you have a variety of, of different kind of um, aspect ratio or or, uh, or form factors, like I said, okay. And then there's a kind of a, a nice gradient in between them. And so because of this, this kind of natural lopsided shape, you can use it to kind of fit into any space that, it, that, it, that you can, right? And so no matter if the space is really skinny or if the space is really wide, you can jam a triangle in there, you know, um, more or less, okay? And so, that's, and so that's really advantageous. And so, you know, um, you can always count on the tets and the triangles to mesh your, your salt. And so if you're ever really struggling to produce a mesh, just switch it over to tetrahedrons and triangles, and then that those will those will get the job done. Okay. Um, unfortunately, you know it, it won't get it done efficiently, and so um, you know even though a, a tetrahedron and a triangle will it'll be able to mesh anything and everything, you know it's not going to do it in an in a in an efficient number of elements. Okay, and so these are not very efficient. And so what I mean by that is, you know, um, if you take a geometry and you try to mesh it with tets, then, you know, you'll get a mesh, but the number of elements that you'll have is going to be higher than, than if you would do it with hexahedrons. okay? All right, and so that brings us to the rectangular elements. And so the rectangular elements generally will be a lot more efficient in meshing a, in meshing a solid, okay? okay. And so they can fill space a lot more efficiently, okay? And so if you ask, you know, if you, if you try to mesh a certain solid with, uh, with triangular elements with, or versus rectangular ones, the rectangular ones will do it in a in much less number of elements, okay? And that's a big advantage. Um, the downside to rectangular elements is that it's, it's not always going to work, okay? Because the thing with the rectangular elements is that they have, you know, very straight sides and very sharp corners. And so, you know, you're, what you're going to see is that if your geometry has a lot of complex curves or a lot of fine features, then the rectangular elements are really going to struggle with that. Okay. And so where these really struggle are, so this can be especially curved and fine geometries. And so you guys, you guys have already seen this, you know, in, in the previous ANSYS activity, right? And so in the, for the bike crank, you know, I, I asked you all to, uh, to produce a mesh with hexahedrons, right? Um, but, when, but when you guys went to actually choose the shape, you know, there was no full hexahedron option. And so the only option that you guys could pick was hex dominant, right? And so that's ANSYS's way of telling you that it's, it's gonna be really hard to fill this entire space with all hexahedrons, but it can try to fit in as many as possible. And in the places where it can't squeeze in a hexahedron, you know, it'll use a, te a tetrahedron to kind of fill in the, fill in the gaps, okay? 
right? But generally, you know, if you can swing it, and so if you can, if you can, you know, um, get it to work, then the rectangular element types are going to be the more preferable one to to use. Okay. And that's mostly just from a cost perspective, right? And so if you can match the same geometry with the less number of elements, but still maintain the same level of accuracy, you know, of course, that's going to be more desirable than, than not, okay? And so, um, you know, your, your rectangular elements, they're going to be better at filling space. Um, and I, sh I, should have, I should have added that, you know, it does this without sacrificing any accuracy, okay? And so that's why, you know, if you can, if you, if you can, if you can manage it somehow and you can kind of, you know, um, apply your mesh settings in a certain way, it's more preferable to have as many rectangular elements as, as possible. Okay. Okay. Uh, any questions on, on any of this? Oh, professor? Yeah. In terms of the triangles, are they always equilaterals or can they be like different size triangles? That's a great question. Actually, that's a, that's that's actually lead into the next uh, to the next topic I'm gonna go over, which is which is skewness. Oh, okay. and so, um, and so just to answer your question, generally, generally that you want to have, um, you know, equal as much equilateral as you can. Um, but for, you know, most cases it's going to be impossible because there, there's going to be some certain features of your geometry where you just have to kind of fit something in. Um, and so then you're going to end up with some more skew triangles. Yeah. And that's, okay. and that's not a good thing, but you know, we'll, we'll talk about that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right, and so let's talk about, um, and so that's that's actually a perfect segue. And so now let's start talking about skewness. Okay. All right. Um, and so just like, you, you know, just like Sebastian mentioned, you know, um, generally what you want is you, um, the uh, for the finite element simulation, you know, generally you're gonna want to have as many equilateral element shapes as possible. And so this, and so this is true for both the triangles and also for the uh, rectangular elements. Okay. Okay. And so what I mean by equilateral is, is I basically mean that all the the sides of the element, um, all of the you know for for two D all the edge lengths and for three D all of the surface areas and the edge lengths. Okay. All of those are as equal as possible around the element. Okay. Okay. And also um, all the internal angles for the shape should be as, as equal as possible too. And so, you know, I, I won't get into, into the specifics why, because in that you, we kind of need to dive pretty deep into the mathematics of why it does this. But generally, the more equilateral your shapes are, the better quality and the more accurate your finite elements are, are going to be. And so you want to have as not, as many pretty looking elements as, as you can, right? Um, and that's and that's actually the terminology that's that's used, or at least I use it. And so you know you want you want to make sure all of your elements are looking nice and nice and pretty. Okay. You know, unfortunately, you know it's 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 just not possible to get everything to be um, um, equilateral unless you're literally meshing a giant cube. Okay. And so if you're meshing a giant cube, then just fill it with a bunch of little tiny cubes, then all the elements are going to look pretty. Um, but you know you're never going to be meshing just a, a cube just by itself. Uh, what does it say after equal side lengths? Um, equal facet areas, and so for like a three D element, um, you know that's the the, air, the areas of each of the sides. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, so unfortunately, 
impossible to get all pretty elements. Okay. All right, and so, you know, it's impossible to get all elements that look kind of equal model, but ANSYS will do the best that it can. And actually ANSYS, ANSYS measure is actually really, really good. And so I'm, I'm actually really impressed with how good ANSYS' measure is. And, you know, it's, uh, and so ANSYS will do its best, but it's, it's, it's not always possible. Okay. All right, and so let me kind of give you an example for what, you know, what, a, what I call a high quality element looks like versus a, a very distorted kind of skewed one. Okay. And, and so generally, you know, let's let's just use triangles as an example, because I think triangles, it's kind of easiest to visualize. Okay? And so generally, you want your elements to all kind of look like this. Okay? And so this is what I call high quality element. Okay. And so all the sides are about the same length, all of the internal angles are about the same. And so, you know, this is a very, very nice, very nice triangle. Okay. But, you know, it's just inevitable that sometimes, you know, as especially as you get closer to the, as, especially as you get closer to the boundaries, um, you know, you're going to end up with some triangles that might look like this. Okay. And so something like this, and and this is even, you know, and this one actually, you know, in in the grand scheme of things, if I saw this triangle, I wouldn't be worried. Um, but you know, it can get a lot worse than this. And so, but if you just compare this to you know, the left side one, this is what I would call a low quality element. Okay. Right. And the way that we can quantify that is we can look at kind of the, the aspect ratios between these, these guys, right? And so if we look at, you know, this length right here versus the height of the triangle, okay? You can see that the the ratios between these two would be you know something maybe on the order of like ten to one or like you know eight to one okay, uh, but even that's not too bad. And so I, I've seen elements where the aspect ratio is like hundred to one or like two hundred to one, and those are, those are those are really bad. And so you know ten to one you're usually okay still, but you know anything beyond this can be can be kind of bad. Okay. All right, and so you know. Generally, you want to have um, elements that are higher quality than, than that. Um, and so, you know, the next question is, you know, how do you, how do you actually assess this? Because, you know, for any given mesh, you know, you're going to have thousands and thousands of elements. And so, you know, it's, it's not a really good use of your time to look at every single element in your mesh and see if it's actually, you know, looking good like, like that. Um, and so, you know, thankfully, ANSYS has a way to kind of assess the quality of your mesh by measuring what's called the skewness of, of all your elements. Okay. okay. Uh, any questions on, on this? Okay. And so let's say ANSYS can measure the quality Okay. Um, so if like the um, the elements uh, are low quality, then we say it's their skewed elements. Yes. Yeah. 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 And so there, there's, you know, I'm I'm using the term skewness here just because it's I, I think it's the easiest metric to um to um to interpret um just in terms of just the numbers that it shows up. But uh, but you'll see, and I'll show you how to I'll show you how to check this in ANSYS next time too. That there's a lot of different metrics that you can check for mesh quality, and so one of them, one of them actually is aspect ratio. And so you want to look at kind of the the ratio of the, of the longest length of your element versus the shortest length. And so that's 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 one. But I like skewness just because it, it kind of gives you a number between zero and one. And so I think that's really really easy to interpret. Okay. okay. All right. And so you know when you ask ANSYS to measure the quality of your mesh, what it's going to do is going to it's going to visit every single element. 
and then give each element a, a skewness score uh, between zero and one. Okay. And so a skewness of zero, what this basically means is that the element has very little skewness and thus is, is pretty high quality. Okay. Whereas a skewness of one, this is basically maximum skewness. And so this is as low as low quality that you can get. Okay. All right, and so when you, um, you know, and this is very quick to do, and so it, it's not something that takes, you know, a lot of time for ANSYS to, um, to compute. And so once, and so when you're done, you know, when ANSYS is done computing these things, it'll show you basically what the maximum skewness in your model is, what the minimum skewness and the mean, okay. And it's displayed just like that, okay. And it'll all, it'll also show you a histogram of of how much of you know how many elements have a certain skewness in your model. Okay. okay. Right. And so the histogram, you know, it's going to look something like this, and so you might have something like 0 0.02, 0 0.1, 0 0.1 to 0 0.2. 0 0.2. 0 0.3, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, right? And so it's going to compute, you know, all these different buckets, okay? You know, in each bucket, you know, it'll show you approximately how many elements you have in those, in those buckets, okay? And so the graph looks basically something like that, okay? Whereas like the maximum min and mean, you know, it might look something like, you know, maybe the max might be 0 0.9, the min will be 0, 0.0, and the mean might be like 0 0.3. Okay. So these are these are kind of just random numbers. Okay. okay. And so you know um, the question is now is like how how do you use these numbers to actually assess how good or how high quality your mesh is? Okay. And so you know this is another one of those things where you know it's it's there's no real hard and fast rule, so there's no there's no threshold that you have to overcome, but generally you want to have as many high quality elements as possible. Okay. And so kind of a general rule of thumb, and this, and this is from the textbook, um, but I will say that this is, this is really hard to hit, you know, for, for general situations. If you have a maximum skewness, if your maximum skewness is less than 0 0.5, okay, and your mean skewness is less than 0 0.25, If you can hit those two targets, you know, with your mesh, then um, you know your 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 mesh is pretty good. Right? And in fact, I'd say your mesh is really good because it's uh, um, that's that's really really hard to do. Okay. okay. Generally, what you're going to see is that you know, for even for even for you know a moderately simple case. You know, you're you're gonna have a max skewness probably in, on the uh, in the order of like 0 0.8, 0 0.9, um, just because you know there's there's gonna be one weird corner, one weird kind of um, aspect to your geometry where it just has to jam something in there. You know, you have kind of a really skewed element. In it, okay. Um, yeah. So even if we don't reach that sweet spot, it's not the end of the world, right? It's not the end of the world, but it's but. What I would say is that, you know, this is something that you would look at where if you're getting kind of weird simulation results, this is kind of one of the first things that I would look at. And so on your first pass, I, I wouldn't worry about it all too much. But if you're starting to get, you know, some weird results, and we'll talk about, you know, what makes some weird results in the next activity, um, then this is, some, this is something I would start to look at. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's like an average between all the elements, this, this number, the mean one. It's exactly. The average of all the yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Um, and so how do you improve quality, right? And so it's one thing to kind of look at and see what your quality is. Uh, it's another thing to kind of, you know, um, um, do something about it, right? And so kind of, gen and so generally the two things that you can do to improve your quality is you can either, um, one is refine your mesh. And so just kind of, you know, try to fit more elements in there. Generally, this is this is going to make your, your quality much higher, okay? And so that's consistent with what we talked about before, where you know if you make smaller elements, you get a better quality mesh. And so that's you know, and that includes the the element shapes too, right? Because if you make your elements smaller, then there's less there's less kind of finagling and less um, um, you know less kind of weird elements that kind of have to be jammed into weird spaces just because the elements are small, okay? And so the other thing I, I would do most of the time is to kind of is to try a different element shape. And so maybe try, you know, maybe if you're using a rectangular element in a certain area, maybe try a triangular one and see if that works. Um, or maybe, you know, um, you know, pick and choose different areas of the mesh to use different um, element shapes. Okay. And so those are those are the kinds of things that um, that you can do. Um, another another thing, another thing is uh, you know, and yeah, and we'll talk about this in the activity next week is that there, there's going to be just naturally some geometries that are going to be very naturally difficult to mesh um, just because they have very sharp corners and very, you know, very fine features. And so I would say kind of a third, a third, a third element here is to kind of, um, you know, modify your geometry in a way that, that makes it easier to mesh without compromising your, your results. Okay. And so I don't want to add that as, as a third one here, because that, that one, that one's kind of like a little bit of a last resort. Because a lot of times you want to, um, you don't want to change your geometry all too much, just because it's, uh, you know, your geometry is really important. You want to make sure you capture as many details of your geometry as possible in your finite elements. Okay, and so these two, these two things that I listed here, these are things that you can do with the mesh that don't modify your geometry. But once you start to change the geometry, you're kind of changing the problem. And so, you know, you want to avoid doing that. But there, but there are some cases where you kind of, you kind of have to. All right, any questions on uh, any of this? Okay, so we have about five minutes left. And so, you know, I don't think we can get to the end, um, but I will kind of introduce the, uh, the next topic to you, uh, which is element order, okay? And so this is, I think, um, you know, one of the things I got the most questions about, you know, uh, of, you know, what does element order mean and, and what effect does it have on the solution? Okay. And so if you recall from the last activity, you know, I, I had you guys specify the element, the, the order of your elements, you had two options available to you. You had linear and you had quadratic. Okay. And so what these refer to here, uh, what these refer to is uh, these are the orders of polynomials, believe it or not. And so I can, uh, I'll show you kind of a generic, you know, the most general linear function that you can think of, right? And so linear function will have a constant term as well as a linear term, okay? So this is a linear polynomial. And a quadratic polynomial will have the same terms, but one extra one for the quadratic, okay? So we have a zero plus a one X plus a two x squared. So these are quadratic quadratic polynomials. Okay. And so when you're choosing either linear or quadratic, you know you're literally making a choice between these two these two kinds of polynomials. Okay. Um, you know, but what did but what did these have to do? anything with finite elements, right? Because we're, we're doing everything in computers. So why do we have to care about these, okay? And so the reason, you know, this is a, this is a choice in finite elements is that, you know, remember, remember I mentioned before that, you know, finite elements, you know, what you're doing is that you're, you're, you're forming an approximation or you're forming an approximate solution to the differential equations across your elements. Okay? 
And the way it does these approximations is that it, um, you know, it, it basically first, it first assumes what it thinks the solution looks like. And then it tries to find the best, you know, the best um, type uh, or the best function of that type that fits the solution, okay? So it's kind of a mouthful. So let me go ahead and write that down. Okay. And so when you're making the choice between either a linear element or a quadratic element, you're choosing basically what the finite element software is going to assume of the solution. Okay. And so if you choose a linear, a linear order, then you're um, basically saying that, you know, the finite element solution can assume that the solution looks linear. Okay. But if you choose a quadratic one, then you're saying that, you know, the, um, we're going to assume that the solution looks like a quadratic. Okay. And so this is, this is kind of a, a backwards way to kind of solve a problem. And I, and I, you know, and this is kind of the area where I, I kind of wish we dived a little bit more in the theory because just to kind of show you what this means. But generally, you know, when you solve a differential equation, you know, think back to your math classes of 308, you, you first solve the equation and then you classify the solution, right? And so you solve the differential equation and you say, okay, this is a quadratic or this is a sign you solve, right? And so what finite elements does is it kind of does it in the reverse and it says, you know, I'm going to say that no matter what you give me, the solution looks like a quadratic. And the differential equation should be like, put, put, put. And it's like, nope, it's going to be a quadratic. And then what it does is then it, it finds the best quadratic that will fit the solution as, as best as possible. Okay? And, this, and this is actually the key step that makes finite elements you know, as powerful as it is, because then it doesn't have to find time. It doesn't have to try to find you know, what the solution actually looks like. It already kind of decides that beforehand and finds the best one. All right, and so on Thursday, you know, we'll talk about what 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 um, you know what effect this actually has on your solution because it actually does have some profound impacts and what that means for you in terms of you know how you actually use the software. Okay? All right, so we're out of time, and so you know, thank you guys for for coming today. Um, you know, um, let me know if you have any questions on the activity, and I'll see you guys on Thursday. Professor, would that our solution be like a uh, form like sine and cosines and stuff like that, like not you know not linear? Quadratic. It's you can, and and actually, you know, um, you know, if we were diving more into the theory, then you know, I, I would have you actually do some exercises where you assume it's a sinusoid. Um, but for but for like a, a big software like Ansys, it's just not practical to do a sinusoid just because. So it's like basically software that people just create on their own, like yeah. code on their own. Yeah. So polynomials usually work the best for you, just because they're so you know they can they can do they can do so many things with polynomials. Okay. 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 Yeah, yeah. It's Thanks, you too.
Yep. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's uh, um, you know, just if you're the last one here, just turn off the mics and then just close the door, and then that's that's good.